Welcome to The Road. This is a weekly podcast of All Saints Lutheran Church. I'm your host, John Pedersen, and I serve as pastor. Each week, we reflect on faith, life, and navigating the road ahead. The language of journey is common when we think about life. It has its joys and challenges along the way, and we all need a little encouragement and guidance at times to keep us going. There's a word in the Bible, asphalia, which means truth, but it's the same root word we use in English for asphalt, if you can believe that. It's a solid surface that makes travel easier and more assured. And so every week we're going to be exploring elements of faith and life that keep us on the road. Faith isn't about living a perfect life. It's about finding our way, getting through rough spots, but seeking out those great vistas too. You can find my weekly message here, but you'll also find special conversations with guests who have insights on things like wellness, parenting, and living with unique purpose. If you appreciate this podcast, remember to subscribe where possible and share it with a friend. Here's this week's message. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, which begins with Jesus tempted in the desert, as we just heard. The devil uses the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness as an opportune time to break him. Each temptation has its own method and scheme, but they're all tests geared toward making Jesus care more about himself and his own needs than the people he was sent to serve. If the devil can get Jesus preoccupied with himself, then he wins. There's a common image in Christian theology for explaining the nature of sin, and it involves being curved in on yourself. And that image helps us understand its impact on both relationships and being faithful to a mission bigger than ourselves. So I wanna walk through this account of Jesus and then come back to the implications of that because we know on one hand that we're supposed to be selfless, but that we also need to take care of ourselves as well. So we'll get to that tension. But the first temptation goes to a basic human experience, hunger. Jesus had eaten nothing during his time in the wilderness, and we know he changed water into wine and fed 5,000 later in his ministry. Turning a stone into a loaf of bread certainly seemed doable for him. Um, Of all three temptations, from a human perspective, it seems the most arbitrary. Eating for survival shouldn't be something that is bad in any way, but it really gets down to the deeper importance. Can Jesus rise above hardship and adversity and remain faithful to his mission. In this, his particular case, will he be able to put aside survival for a larger mission? And along with that, because Jesus is capable of so much, will Jesus use his miraculous power to serve himself and his own needs or to serve others? Whenever Jesus performs a miracle in his ministry, whether it's healings, or feeding 5,000, or stilling a storm, or walking on water. It's either to help someone or to help teach his disciples something. Jesus resists the urge to simply rely on himself. The second temptation is all about power. We see the exercise of power in the headlines this week with war in Ukraine, but power goes beyond war and politics. Power exists in relationships, business, communities, and wherever people are. Power in itself is not a bad thing. It exists. It's about how it gets used. Is it used by those who have it to serve themselves? Or is there some process to help ensure it is used for the good of the whole? What the devil is offering Jesus is the opportunity to seize power and to acknowledge the devil's power. Jesus, of course, does neither. Christian faith teaches something revolutionary about power. Power in any form, money, status, education, position is not for seizing and controlling for personal gain. Power is for using for the sake of others, to protect people, to serve people, to empower people. St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. In short, why is it that having a son of God who dies rather than conquers a sign of strength 
and not weakness. The message of the cross is about Christ's sacrifice for us. As Paul writes in Philippians 2, Jesus did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Jesus used up his power for the sake of others. He relinquished it on the cross. Peter says in Acts 2, God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Jesus demonstrates a form of power that looks weak to the world, but is able to overcome death. The ability of Jesus to resist the second temptation is also why Jesus had the strength and faith to carry out his mission to the end, even to the point of death. We may continually fall short of that principle, but we are called to value it and honor it and seek to live it out. There are different ways to think about the final temptation. Is it about proper use of scripture? Is it about doubt? In part, probably both of those, but I'd like to suggest it's also about identity. What's important about this test is that the devil begins with the word if. He does it in the first temptation as well. If you are the son of God, then do this. He's sowing seeds of doubt. Am I really the son of God? Sometimes the simple act of raising the question is enough to call it into question. But Jesus chooses to trust what he already knows. He chooses to believe in the words he heard at his baptism. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. He doesn't need anything more than that. He doesn't need to prove anything to himself as well. Sometimes you might wonder, you know, am I good enough? Does God really love me? Martin Luther, during periods of spiritual struggle and doubt, often returned to his own baptism as a source of reassurance and affirmation as a child of God. Doubt is natural. Every Christian has doubts. The presence of doubt isn't unusual. A key question in faith is whether we allow our doubts about being loved by God to turn us in on ourselves. Love and grace allow us to open up and turn to others and to God. That's why grace is so important in our faith. It's the central component component of what Jesus taught and what he lived for. When we overemphasize do's and don'ts and turn to shame and blame in order to get people to change, it very often backfires. They tend to turn inward that much more. For people to fully embrace others, we need a foundation of love and grace to build upon. But again, the common thread in all of these temptations is about testing Jesus to see if he'll place his own needs and desires above the needs of the people he's been called to serve and above his mission. Will he take his position and power as license to do simply what's good for himself? Jesus boldly demonstrates that his story will not be a typical one. No fulfillment of the old axiom, power corrupts. So given this whole story, I think it's important to ask a question that goes to the heart of it. If faith teaches us not to be curved in on ourselves, are we allowed to care for ourselves? I've gotten that question in various forms over the years, might be obvious, but the answer is yes. Today's story illustrates a simple principle. There are particular times when we're called to be selfless and not put ourselves first. That runs contrary to many of our instincts, which is why this story is powerful. That doesn't mean we should ignore our own health or our needs overall. On the contrary, by honoring our own health and well-being, we actually respect the gift that our life represents. Doing so strengthens us to live more outwardly and to serve day after day, to use what power we have responsibly, to be confident in our identity as a child of God, to feed ourselves and others out of our abundance. If you don't take care of yourself, you'll become depleted and become more focused on personal survival, which then also turns you inward. So a life of faith involves flexibility and moving back and forth between focusing inward and outward. So obviously this text doesn't mean we should live our entire lives depleted and ignore ourselves, but it does challenge us to remember that 
we're called to live our lives in service to others. And some do live sacrificially in profound ways. So many medical professionals over the course of the pandemic have risked their own health and worked extended hours for months on end to help and serve others. I just saw an article on how many EMTs are resigning due to burnout. All of us are human. At best, we can live completely selfless for a season before we need to replenish our energy. When there's no opportunity to do that, it just leads to further depletion or operating on low power continuously. But when we have the reserves at important moments and in key places throughout life, when we put others first, it can be transformational and revolutionary. There may be days or seasons when we're called to do this. It can disrupt the normal patterns of the world that would otherwise be every man, woman, and child for themselves. That kind of a gift is an act of grace. And so may God bless and strengthen all those who serve selflessly for our sake. Amen. That's this week's message. You don't have to navigate the road ahead alone. You can join with others at All Saints. Visit allsaintsmtka.org for more information. Have a great week.